Welcome everybody to this week's edition of Lumix Live. Uh, we, we have a really fun kind of pretty technical, but then also uh, uh, kind of a little more loose conversation for everyone today. Uh, as the title, you know, kind of gives away, we are talking about the entire S series uh, now that the Lumix S5 has been released. So I... Uh, if you're new to these Lumix Live events, welcome. Uh, these are weekly events that we hold on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. I uh, really to just have a conversation with all of you and with different photographers, videographers, tech people, uh, really anyone in the industry that's relevant to the different styles of photography and videography that all of us are doing. Uh, these events are hosted on YouTube currently. Uh, we are looking at trying to broaden the the actual delivery method of these so that everyone can have maybe a little little bit more flexibility to actually view on these so stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed to the channel for when we start to uh, reach further audiences a uh, little bit of housekeeping for everybody if you are new and you have a question for myself or any of our guests make sure to in the comment section tag at lumix cameras so that we can see it pop up in the chat on my end here the whole purpose of these events are to have a conversation with you guys to provide some information about new products new equipment different styles of photography and really provide another resource out there for you guys to to enjoy to actually participate in and also get your your opinions your comments and your recommendations across to the team here at panasonic so we're really really excited about how this platform has grown since around april when we started it for those, again, uh, make sure that if you like this content and you want to see more of it, make sure to be liking and subscribing the, to the Lumix Cameras channel. It helps us out immensely in growing these and finding new ways to reach out to everybody. And make sure to stay tuned to the end because we have a couple different kind of programming things that I want to bounce off everybody and kind of put out into the, the uh, uh, community there for ways that we can expand the content on this Lumix Live uh, throughout the evolution. So as we've said, I, that, all tongue tied this morning, it's, it's been a long morning. As we've been, uh, uh, you know, going through this, we, we have Lumix Global Ambassadors joining us, and today is no different. Today, I am joined by Lumix Global Ambassador Diamond to uh, talk about the Lumix S series. So, hey, Diamond, how are you? Good. Nice to see you. And, uh, <laughs> well, digitally meeting everybody uh, out there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's 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 definitely been a very interesting time having to uh, change the way we we evolve and the way we communicate with e each other. But this has definitely been a fun experience, at least for me. So um, to start things off, can you give uh, the viewers some, you know, kind of insight as to who you are, uh, a little bit of your background uh, and, and what you do as a photographer, videographer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Daimon Xantopoulos. Uh, I'm a Dutch photographer, but with a Greek uh, origin, as you can hear in my name. Um, yeah, I'm, I've started as a photojournalist, a documentary maker, um, been working a lot for newspapers and magazine. I can actually show you some, some things if you like. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, let me share my screen with you all. Yeah, yeah definitely. And so I can actually show you a little bit uh, more about myself. So, um, well, my name is Diamond. I have a website, of course, uh, and also social media. It's always great to meet new people if you have questions afterwards and still want to ask them. Um, my work started a lot uh, around uh, social issues and, um, and, and post-conflict uh, stories. So this is a lot in North Uganda, Sudan, Darfur. Um, the position of children worldwide for a lot of years have been photographing uh, what happens in the world uh, during these uh, situations with children for organizations like UNICEF also and Terre des Hommes. Um, so this is a little bit my, my um, yeah, this is why I really wanted to become a photographer. And my work is being published worldwide by magazines, newspapers. Um, this is some big stories I did in some Dutch newspapers in the last year much more international stories, uh, also in magazines. Uh, some of the Dutch edition of National Geographic, for example, I've been making documentaries for, but also television. And the more and more I worked, the more I realized that if I really want to 
make an impact with my stories, and this is what it's all about for me, then uh, I needed to to change my we uh, working way. I needed to be much more digital oriented and uh, engage with the public on new media. Uh, this is one of my la la yeah, latest projects with this more an exhibition project with a book. And uh, yeah, we'll tell you more about it later. <laughs> So let me first introduce why did I, for example, why did why do I choose for Lumix? And um, I think it's an interesting talk always because when I talk to people, sometimes we talk about cameras like they're a race car um, competing on a racetrack. Who is the first over the finish line? But as a photographer, for me, it's all about actually having a tool that um, uh, that that lets me create. Uh, stories and uh, publish my stories in all ways. And as a photographer, you come across all types of situations. So the one day you can be in the mountains, the next day you're in a city, and the next day you are suddenly uh, doing a documentary film. Yeah. And I think this is also how I look at it. So when I chose uh, a Lumix camera, um, for me, the main choice was I wanted a hybrid system. I didn't want to bring for every situation another camera and another lens. Another. I was looking at a system that would support me as strongly into the new video area I was I was evolving in, but also allow me to to do photography with it and much more hybrid. And so my first uh, cameras that that in a way connected me to Lumix were of course the GH cameras that are really hybrid photo video cameras. Uh, and they allowed me to do my way of working close to people, uh, uh, really um, uh, make films much more as a photographer with a camera that I knew. Uh, and I think as a photographer, if you start filming, it's really powerful if you can actually use the equipment you, you use every day, uh, which is your camera, instead of having to learn ENG uh, broadcast kind of video equipment. And I could also see that it became part of my handwriting. So this is a little bit how I got into uh, Lumix. And of course, with the Lumix S system, I think we are now at the position where we have endless possibilities. Uh, but still, you have, of course, a few differences between the cameras. So I th this yeah. is what we are going to talk today about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um... Yeah, so I think um, for for a lot of people that are that are tuning in here, you know, there's there's a whole lot that um, I think has always been a little kind of confusing about the existing Lumix lineup, both in the Micro Four Third system and in the S series. And as someone who has shot with both of those systems. What would you feel is, um, obviously, before we jump into the actual conversation about the, the S series cameras, how do you feel the balance of Micro Four Thirds cameras for professional work and the S series uh, really fits into your workflow? I know we were talking a little bit about this before the stream went live. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, it's again, it's, it's, for me, it's not a competition uh, between cameras or between systems. Um, I still use the GH5, for example, a lot. I had a job uh, just not so long ago where I was asked to go into a refugee camp, really difficult situation um, because the time frame. I got only a visa for four days, uh, which allowed me four times, four hours in the camp. And I needed to do a whole documentary campaign shooting of around 10 minutes, which is for those who make video now, it's quite challenging in that kind of situation, especially in a refugee camp of 1 million people with no, no, um, uh, not nothing uh, infrastructure and so on. So this is where for me, the GH5 is such a powerful camera. You know, it was monsoon, it was raining all day. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't bring a lot of equipment. So then you go back to the basics. You take the GH, uh, you have a, a few really good lenses. And I still love the system. I think it's one of the system that made a lot of us even go into video. I mean, it mm -hmm. allowed me to, to, to really publish um, on even on television quality content from such a small form factor. And of course, the S5 is also small, but it's a different camera. I still believe the S system, the, sorry, the G8 system has a lot of other uh, abilities uh, like the lenses, very, very powerful, very small. You can have a whole suitcase full of lenses and still you have nothing with you. I think that's, that's great. Uh, the S system for me brought something extra uh, on another level. So, for example, the S1 
gives me also the full frame abilities, which I think are really cool. Um, gives me also um, the S1R, yeah, gives me the studio kind of performance. And S1H, I think, brings us even closer to cinema. So yeah. um, I think this we're going to talk in detail about, but uh, I think it's just another step that it actually delivers. So I don't see it as the one taking over the other system. I actually see, hey, if you're wanting to evolve your studios, and let's face it, there are really a lot of, um, of filmmakers that I've seen starting um, in their own houses or upstairs with a computer and a laptop and then over the months or over the years became small small studios and these small studios uh, are now advancing into really commercial kind of shootings and hey they can just upgrade their system with the same technology they're used to and i think this is really the powerful uh, the powerful thing yeah yeah i mean that's 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 kind of like the the perfect way i've always you know thought about about these series it's tools for the job that you want to go at and the fact that they live so comfortably with each other same menus all of that kind of stuff usability uh being very similar in them it it hopefully i i, I would say those of us that obviously are very close with the product we we see a lot of this in day to day but um oh sorry well, switching my, all my stuff sorry. around here <laughs> i'm sorry I'm no sorry. it's all good um so yeah there's a whole lot of of synergy that goes on between all of our systems but i know you've got a, a um some good information prepared here so let's kind of jump into it and go through each of the cameras what what you find has really been the best uh, you know of them and then just kind of tear the s system apart like that and really put it into perspective for a lot of people Absolutely. Well, I think um, I've prepared some footage because I always like to talk, of course, about the technology, but I think it's even more powerful if we can show um, uh, practical use at the end. Exactly. Um, it, there, there are cameras that need to be used. So my, um, if I look at the S1 system, and let's start just with the S1, because everybody always wants to talk about the S1R or the S1H, because they are, of course, highlighted cameras in their own territories. But I think the S1H is a highly underestimated camera, if you ask me. Um, the only average thing you could possibly say is maybe the 24 megapixels. But on the other hand, 24 megapixels is all you need for 80% of, of the work. So uh, even there, I think it's, it's, um, it's just between the other two, it shows a little bit like a more general camera. But in my opinion, it's the most versatile camera. So uh, my, one of my first shots uh, I did was in Hawaii. And uh, this was where, of course, I, I yeah, get to know the camera. Uh, photography wise, for me, this camera really excels in different uh, areas, but especially, um, of course, the full frame look, but especially also the high ISO performance. So it's a camera that you take easily uh, out in really low light situation. And um, this is, for example, some night shooting the left picture is just a handheld shooting. I'm not nothing doing there with tripods or anything. And the right picture is the Orion constellation for those who know it. Um, and actually it's it's um, uh, pretty, pretty amazing to photograph this with just a 70 millimeter. I'm not using a telescope or anything. Yeah. Um, and the amount of clarity in this, and not so much about just seeing the stars, but also being able to distinguish. Uh, and if we go closer, to distinguish the yellow star, which is a dying star, we call it the Betelgeuse. Uh, it's been in the news recently again. Um, and we're waiting for the supernova to happen. And because it's a dying star, it's, it's, it's a different color. And the camera just captures that. And I think this is, for me, photographically quite amazing. But also the purple gas uh, kind of uh, thing you see on the right, um, the M51, I think it's called officially. Um, pretty amazing stuff for a camera which is just, you know, high ISO performance. Of course, this is, this is just a very focused photograph, but for me, it shows also how well it actually does this. And I know we're yeah. on a stream, so you don't get every quality. <laughs> but of course, when you come from, uh, uh, look them up online, they're, they're everywhere, or at least at some places. Uh, yeah. But let's get back what we started talking about. If you're talking about GH cameras, uh, you're used to certain features which are built in. I like cameras to be simple. Uh, I, I'm a photographer who's, who started actually analog, so uh, I like this, the, the, the most simple things. But through the years, I realized that 
having features built in can actually be really, really uh, uh, yeah, handy on the moment you use them. So there's a lot of technology in these cameras that a lot of times I don't use up to the moment that actually you think, oh, now I'm struggling, and then you use the technology and it helps you so much. So this is me working at night. And for those who've been photographing at night, especially in mountainous areas, it's really difficult to keep your eyesight during the photography because you get uh, so much light from these uh, cameras. And it makes you in a way nine blind, uh, nine night blindness. <laughs> Sorry, my English. Um, no, it's all good. In, in, <laughs> yeah, in, but in, the important thing is for those who, who know this, um, these cameras have a night vision kind of, um, we, we call it night mode, where you turn the camera really red and it gives you the ability to see what you're doing without losing your sight. And this is me in a normal situation as a photograph, but this is actually much more the real life situation when you're photographing at night. And these technologies that you've seen, for example, in a G9 or in a GH5S or that these kind of cameras are also in this S system. And this, in a way, makes sure that you can shoot at night and I've just photoshopped it because the red light is really uh, difficult to photograph because it's <laughs> more for our eyes. Um, but it gives you an idea. I can actually see what I'm doing. And with with um, with a screen, I can have the left screen is, is how it would normally look. And the right screen is boosted by this camera. And the boosted uh, uh, side for me helps me to do the composition really accurately. So at night, com making a composition in this darkness at left, you don't see the, for example, electricity lines at all. But in the right, you see. And it's a little bit uh, noisy picture in the camera, but when you actually shoot it, it's clean. So it just helps you do your photography thing. Um, if you want to use the, the, the red, it's just a little bit red, but the photograph is normal. A very simple technology, but really a game changer uh, when shooting at night and have, wanting to do this night kind of photography scenes and really be accurate in, in where you place your subjects and everything. Yeah. So these are just um, a few things. And of course, this is also S S one. So this is on, shot on the S one on one of the mountain areas, um, and yeah, you get so much uh, low light uh, abilities. In the same yeah. camera, we're talking about features. Eh? Uh, now, ask me anything if you want to, to come. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Go for it. As 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 uh, questions come up, I'll definitely be uh, uh, presenting them for when it's relevant to what we're talking about. Um, for everybody else that's in there, um, we make sure you are tagging at Lumix cameras so I can see the questions. I see a couple of questions coming in, but for me to find them as we go through this becomes really hard if you're not tagging at Lumix cameras. The technical questions we will be addressing more in depth at the end of once we kind of cover all the cameras. So if you ask your question, we don't answer it immediately. Hang tight. We, we are going to get to the questions. <laughs> so, yeah. So back to the S1. Yeah. Well, I think um, we just very quickly talked about this night capabilities of this camera, but it's the same in this camera. If you're doing landscape photography, and I was doing some landscape in Hawaii, um, just as easy, you can just shoot a high resolution mode. You get the high resolution picture and the normal picture. And here you see me on one of these volcano kind of areas where I'm shooting uh, uh, the landscape. And it just gives me immediately this, this high resolution landscape, 96 megapixels which is really nice. We're still talking about a very uh, a camera that's really good in, in a lot of things, but also for these kind of uh, big, big prints, uh, you just get them out of your S1. And I think this is really, uh, yeah, I really like this feature. And the same here with, uh, uh, of course, the area that's been covered by the last eruption, the lava, such an impressive island, such an impressive area, uh, and such a privilege to photograph there. And uh, for me, it's, it's nice that you can actually just focus on your work and at the same time think, ah, oh, I'm doing this picture on a tripod anyway because I want maximum sharpness. Why not just turn on the high resolution modes? It's there to use. And I think yeah. this, these functions are so easy and so nice. If you're not used to them, make sure to try them out. Of course, photography is a lot about connecting with people. So for me, um, uh, the most work as a photographer is to get to know people, to have that conversation, to have that connection. So the one thing I always find difficult, especially with children, uh, is when you're photographing them, you want to really be in touch with them and not have to all the time worry, is the eye sharp when I'm photographing, uh, and I want the composition and you forget actually talking to the person. 
With the S1, for example, what I really like to do is I'm talking, I know the autofocus will catch his eye, it has this eye autofocus, and I can focus on composition and much more about the relation with the person I'm photographing. In this sense, uh, I was photographing a hula dancer, one of the traditional uh, dancers from the island. Um, at the right picture, you see one of the miracle trees, a holy tree on the big island of Hawaii. And I was struggling because it's such an, an amazing tree, it's so big. How do you photograph it, but how do you get it miracle, you know? So I was actually using yeah. long exposures, dual ES to stabilize the shot itself and then zoom out while, while taking pictures, just to give it the extra edge of that light splintering through uh, the, 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 the tree. And I think this is really nice. Here you see also dual ES is really used mostly to, to of course, get our, our shots sharper at longer, uh, yeah, longer aperture, or longer shutter, sorry. Uh, but here you can see how I actually use it as a creative way to enhance something I want to uh, capture. Yeah. So the eye autofocus, for those who don't know it, but I'm sure everybody does, uh, it's, it helps you uh, also in your composition. So for me, it's a blessing because I can really all the time get get the shot how I want it and let the camera do the technical part in this in this sense. Uh, and the sharpness is great. The, even the low light here also, I'm photographing this younger generation of hula dancers uh, in low light at the back. It's only uh, TL light uh, at night and uh, and the sharpness is just spot on. And I think this is uh, yeah. wonderful as a photographer. You can focus so much on actually the creational process. So yeah, for me, S1 is a camera that does a lot of things really well. Uh, and wh whether you want to take it in the mountain, do close-ups, do a documentary, do live events, it's a camera it can handle it all, you know? And, and there's yeah. a lot of things I really like, the viewfinder and, and everything. Um, but of course, we haven't talked at all about uh, the video function and also the durability. So I think in general, yeah. the 3S system cameras, the S1, S1R, S1H, they're all three really built for professional use. And you can see that on anything. Yes, they're a little bit big, they're a little bit tough, they're weather sealed, they have everything a professional wants. In, 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 a, in a class, so a really high class, high resolution, a viewfinder, direct controls. I don't mind how my camera looks. For me, it's important I can access certain functions directly. And in this sense, I'm shooting a time lapse for the opening of the Hawaii film and I had to leave it there for, I think, four or five hours to do a time lapse. And it called, um, it's called, it's the Valley of the Winds, but it's one of the wettest places on earth because it's raining there, very tiny rain all day. It's, it's as Oof. you can see, very green. So my first idea was, yeah, okay, I hope it will actually do it. I know it's weather sealed, but still there's, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, moisture. But through the hours, nothing, it just keeps working. It just keeps performing. And it's nice to know that from your equipment that you know it can handle this. Don't worry, just focus on what you need to actually make. Yeah. And at the end, it's, it's just very quickly, this is the scene I was actually time-lapsing, and it's the opening of the film. This film is online if you want to see it. Uh, it starts with a, a song poem, actually, as some kind of um, uh, saying from, from one of the uh, healers from Hawaii. And you can see the time-lapse, how it's uh, slowly evolving, and at the end, it, uh, yeah, it, the film starts... So, of course, S1, as, as most people know, from coming from G8 or from G9 series, everything uh, you're used to works the same way, uh, like audio controls. Uh, you can just connect your audio equipment to it. You can even do external recording if you wish. Uh, here you see the flip-out screen. I really like that screen because it helps me to position the camera left, sit right, have the conversation, uh, crossing uh, uh, the interviewer in this sense. And, um, and doing the audio wireless. And uh, I think this is, uh, yeah, it, it's all there. So you're still talking about your photographic camera that you can bring anywhere. And at the same time, it's suddenly a video camera you can do uh, a, a decent, good interview with and, uh, and make a production. We've even done the, um, also the, the live series, the launch of the S1 film. I filmed it myself on the S1, which I think shows how far you can actually use this camera in all kinds of situations. I'm not going to play it for you. It's online, uh, but there's something else I want to show <laughs> because I think that's really cool. So this was my first trip to Hawaii. It was one of my first trips, and I didn't really know, of course, as a lot of times a new camera comes out, what is really the limit of what this camera can do? 
Well, the limit of this camera and how versatile it is for me really came to show in this documentary I'm doing in the Netherlands. This was um, a, a small family living in the uh, north, uh, south of Netherlands, sorry. <laughs> and they are fishermen for generations. This is one of the oldest uh, uh, yeah, work they do for generations. They fish by using, putting sticks in the, in the water and uh, the fish, they, they anchovy, they, they swim with, with the tides, they swim into the area and then they collect them. And this is a really old tradition. It's one of the oldest way of fishing you can find on, uh, on Earth. And there's only one family in the Netherlands, actually within Europe, I think two families that are still doing this. So I wanted to shoot this, but they go at night out because during the day they get all the birds coming in to catch actually the fish from the net. So they only go out at night. I'm talking three o'clock at night, in the middle of the night, they Oof. start collecting these up, up to the morning. So they arrive back, back uh, at the harbor around five o'clock in the morning. So I brought my S uh, system, uh, S1 system, and of course you have a few challenges. It's a small boat, so you don't take big tripods and stuff like that. But also there's no sense of using a tripod because the boat is moving all the time on the tide. So if you put it on a tripod, your camera will just move like the boat. <laughs> it's not nothing yeah. you can do. Yeah. So everything was shot handheld uh, in extremely low light, which means 30,000 ISO filming. Um, and then, uh, yeah, everything from from handheld shooting, and this is for me. It just shows what this what this camera is capable of. Uh, we're not talking S one H. We're still talking S one, but just uh, amazing how good this camera is. Uh, it's in Dutch. The translation is on YouTube. You can hear uh, what they're saying. Uh, well, at least with subtitles. But just to give you an impression about the film. Yeah. If it plays. <laughs> yeah, and, and for, for everyone that wants to see any of these pieces of content that we're showing, videos, photos, things like that, uh, when this video is uploaded onto YouTube, we will be putting the cards above each of the uh, points in this uh, stream when we start showing some content. So you'll be able to actually see it in the highest quality possible since uh, restreaming video tends to get a little choppy with some audio and some video chop. But yeah, Absolutely. you know, just look at these reflections, you know, how how amazing small details, you know, we're talking about 30,000 ISO shots. Eh? I mean, um, and how good it captures for me the colors, you know, I think this is uh, I'm, I was really excited when I saw this in post. I was like, wow, this is really amazing. <laughs> and this is, you know, full frame quality video. Eh? I mean, uh, you can see the shadow depth of field. You can see the small grades. You can see. It's, there's so much in this, um, uh, and this this was of course before the launch of the S1H, uh, but it just I was really amazed uh, what this camera is capable of, and also how how steady it keeps the horizon. How uh, I mean, we're on water all the time, we're oh, even yeah. in the water at some points, and it just you know it's rock solid. Uh, I think this is uh, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I I I think that's that's what a lot of a lot of people can can take a look at is that as the cameras sat when we launched them this was before any firmware updates came out this was before obviously even the s1h came out they're they're incredibly high level performing cameras because like you just like you mentioned they're they were designed for professional workflow and in a lot of cases we've become caught up in the size argument about full frame cameras or cameras in general but it really goes into that conversation that a, a camera or a lens or whatever piece of equipment you're using, an audio recorder, professional design doesn't always have to be, and a lot of times doesn't necessarily mean the smallest in technology. It means that it's designed to be reliable, it's designed to be robust, it means that when you click record or you set the camera to 30,000 ISO like what you're doing there, the camera's going to perform as it should. It's not going to throw you a curveball once you actually start working with it. Or with that time lapse, when you're sitting out in the middle of, of a rainforest, you don't have to constantly sit and think, uh, you know, should I should I go back and make sure the camera's dried off? Or do I need to set up some sort of awning to protect the camera? They, they have to work. It, it's a professional grade tool. And that's what I think sets the S series apart from 
the rest of the cameras in the industry. I mean, we've got class leading stabilization, as you've shown. We've got class leading uh, weather resistance, like you've said. Uh, up until recently, obviously, and, and we'll be totally transparent with it. Up until recently, we had class leading electronic viewfinders, but that also goes to show how fast technology changes even from, you know, within a single single year. So seeing the the work that you've got, seeing how the cameras reacted in a ton of these different environments, I think is a testament to how well built and how well thought out these cameras have been. Um, Let's see, I, I've seen a couple of questions coming through, and actually, I want to I want to bounce a couple of them off you. Um, yeah, absolutely. one of the questions here from Glenn was the videos that you're shooting were these shot in vlog or were they in one of the other color profiles? I wanted to say, well, <laughs> this one is shot in ALG, which is hybrid lock gamma, and um, this is S1, huh? and uh, why I really like it is because it gives me this wide grading possibility. So yes, it looks exactly the same on an, on an ALG television, OLED, uh, but this is an SDR version. It just, just looks as great. And for me, uh, S1, uh, I use here the a ALG, especially also because of the dynamic range. I don't know if you saw the few shots before, you had this sun right in the frame and you had the fish in front of you and you know everything is there. So this is, uh, this is amazing in post. Uh, what I did in this film specifically is uh, this was, of course, uh, one of the first uh, films that I did some really good grading on. Is I filmed <laughs> everything in one in one set, and then I created one LUT for the whole film. So I'm not doing any every shot uh, separate grading as a lot of graders uh, mostly do. But I made one custom LUT myself, which uh, took the ALG, did the conversion to SDR with that same uh, color grading uh, change which is uh, slightly, I mean, it's a little bit saturated, but I love the, the slide film kind of color it has. It's very, uh, yeah, it's very beautiful. I mean, that's the colors. I mean, I really like the colors, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, and here you see it's, it's such a small form factor. We're not talking about cinematic uh, big cameras. We are talking about very down-to-earth handheld shooting. Uh, the only thing what you see, and this is just to give you, uh, uh, when you look at the film, you think, wow, that audio is really nice. It is nice. I have a microphone on the camera uh, for general shots, but I have an audio uh, person with me. And we're actually clapping uh, uh, for, the, for the audio sync. And so we do the audio separate. This is the only thing. So especially with the water yeah. and all the small details of sound. Uh, you're a two-man band and you're doing, uh, yeah, you're making this short film, but it's, it sh just shows how, how far you can actually bring the S1. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and that's that's kind of, again, one of the kind of cool things that, that I think may get lost in a lot of the conversation is that all of this is with the S1 so far. So you're, you're talking... S1. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're we're talking the camera that is designed to be kind of a jack of all trades in the system, you know, was the first uh, first of the of the series to be released. It was always, you know, built out as a true hybrid camera in a professional build in a professional tier of camera, and it really shows that it has that balance of cinematic style quality and capabilities high-end pro uh, photographic capabilities. And as an evolution, the other cameras kind of grow out of that base because it all has to start somewhere um, in, in yeah. every camera design. Yeah, and this is why I said, for me, it's the underestimated camera because it's yeah. actually a really good camera. But if I have a photographic assignment, my first thought is, oh, I'll take the S1R. Well, the S1, if I honestly, if I have an assignment uh, these days, a lot of times, if it's purely photographic, I take S1R and the S1 as a backup or a low light capable camera. Um, sometimes it depends on the job. I even take the S1 and have the S1R as a backup. So, um, yeah. And it's to the S1H and then I have the S1 as a backup. So I think this is a little bit of uh, my working way. And of course, it's easy because you can use the same lenses, the same menus the same kind of uh, accessories on it. So I think this is really powerful, but this is, this is just the S1 to show how far and how much you can actually do, because a lot of times we're hearing only about the other two. 
Of course, the other two exactly. have their strengths as well. I, I think uh, we can talk now about the S1R. Yeah. Um, but are there other questions that I need to answer first, or are we uh, good? Um, so let's see here. Uh, one of the questions from, uh, I think it's Jerome, uh, is what is your preferred focus mode when you're working with the cameras? Well, it depends on, uh, on, of course, for photography, I use autofocus. In video, I like to use manual focus. And this is for a long time. Um, but then it depends. So like, for example, the Rohingya series, which I did, the refugee camp, there I use both. When you get in a dynamic scene, I, I like to be able to switch on the autofocus. Uh, but a lot of the things, like an interview, there's no point of using autofocus. Uh, on the boat series, uh, I want to have control over the focus because it's part of, especially in filmmaking, um, putting the focus uh, and, and changing the focus is, is just as part as the composition. So um, I, I don't like to not having the control over that, just as I don't want my aperture to change and my shutter speed. So this is my uh, working way. And um, I use, uh, for example, in, in some films, I use manual lenses also. I use old, uh, old lenses, uh, cinematic lenses especially on the S1H, I like it with a PL adapter. So there's a lot of possibilities, but if I would have a live event, then of course I like to use autofocuses also. So uh, yeah. in a refugee film, I step into a camp, I'm following a woman, there's no time to, to do all that uh, focusing manual. So then I just switch to, to autofocus and uh, yeah. it just works for me perfectly, yeah. Cool. This is cool. also the nice thing of these cameras. Eh? You can customize them. So my front buttons are when I'm doing film, the one is uh, when I press it goes to 100%. So I can do the focusing really softly without really having to search for it. And um, the other button for me just changes. For example, when I'm doing a night, nightscape photography and I go into the mountain, I program it to turn the whole camera to red mode so I can actually shoot at night. So this is the nice thing of these cameras. There's a lot of programming you can actually do in them uh, to suit them for a certain job before you even yeah. Uh, start. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So let's see. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. There's a couple generic, uh, not generic. There's a couple general questions that have come up um, that I'll, I'll uh, address now before we get too far from them. Uh, Cliff is asking, when will the S5 AF update come to the S1H and the S1? Uh, we have announced that that's coming out by the end of the year. Unfortunately, I do not have an actual date or a month for you guys, but it is coming by the end of the year. Uh, and that will also be coming to the S1R as well. So the AF improvements that have been done in the S5 are going to come to the rest of the S series. Um, so make sure to stay tuned be subscribed, all that kind of fun stuff so that you can get uh, as soon as that information is available. Nice um, question. Um, but to mm -hmm. answer also from that point of view, I'm not Panasonic. Eh? So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a photographer and a filmmaker and I love to use the equipment and I'm sharing my thoughts on using them. So um, uh, just for you guys, all, I, I can't say anything that the company is working on because I'm not part of that company. We work closely together on the creative side uh, and to, to a certain level, but for the rest, I'm just as curious as you, uh, you are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, one of the other questions here, uh, from AG, is there a way to change from continuous autofocus to single autofocus? I assume you're meaning in video. Uh, there is. Uh, by default, the camera does, when you go into video, it does by default turn on uh, continuous autofocus. Uh, in the video AF menu, you just go in and turn continuous AF off, and then it becomes a push to focus style system. So you actually push the AF button, if you have it set up that way, get your focus, it stops, and then you can do uh, manual override. That's where you can change a lot of that stuff. Um, for those that want to find out where all of that stuff is in the menu, definitely check out the Panasonic Help YouTube channel. There's, I think, something like 70 videos on the uh, on the S series that actually goes through all of the menus, where to find everything, how to get it. So that's that's a pretty cool um, setup there. Uh, let's see the next question. Um, 
Wow, I just lost my place here. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Uh, any chance of reply? Gimbal follow focus motor for the S1 or forwarding it. I've asked very pan various Panasonic people at a time. It's still not fixed. Um, I think actually you have actually, I think, asked me on one of the uh, Facebook groups. Uh, that information has been sent over. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any actual update or information about what uh, is going on there. Uh, but those questions have been asked and we will have uh, the it's it's in the pipeline so if there's any any information about that kind of stuff you'll hear it here you'll hear it in the emails you hear it in a firmware update that kind of stuff if it's something that's being held on our side um let's see a uh, question for you da um uh, diamond i uh, could Diamond comment on whether he would like to use his S1R as a B cam to the S1 or the S1H? Well, uh, it's possible, but um, uh, for me, I like the S1 more uh, as a video B cam. Um, of course, uh, no, I, I've never really considered doing that, actually. I know it's possible, <laughs> um, but it's even if it's really important, I can even uh, shoot with uh, with two cameras, also two S1H, if 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 it's needed for the job. Um, but I think what I like for S1, for example, is just because it's an easy camera, also photographically, I like to have it extra with me, uh, and I know how versatile. I mean, you have to see it from a different way. I started with the S1. Uh, I worked some stories with it. So you get a relation. I really like certain things of the camera. And then when the S1H came, um, for me, I really loved the, in a way, unprecedented access. You get to a lot of extras and a lot of uh, open gate ideas. Eh? You have a much higher resolution. You can do uh, all kinds of much more video oriented things. Um, but I, in, the, in that period, I already had a relation with the S1. It, I took it to a certain amount of jobs. So if I go somewhere, I want to have stuff that I can trust it will do the job. And I know the S1 will, will blindly just as good be part of a film as, as the S1H is. Uh, the S1R for me really is the kind of camera I would mainly use for photography. Of course, the video function is absolutely not bad. You have full frame video, which is really, really cool. Uh, but I think um, I'm pretty sure that if it comes to that point, I will actually use the S1H. Yeah, I hope it it replies a little bit to uh, to the question. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean that's that's kind of like the, the the cool thing. Like what we've said a lot with this this uh, this session here is that there are there's the right tool for the right job, and the way the the S series ecosystem is designed is that they're all very complementary to each other, depending on your workflow. So if you're very video oriented in your workflow. An S1 and S1H are going to sit really nicely next to each other. Now that we have the S5, the S5 can also fit into Absolutely. that, you know, kind of workflow. But they're all for different reasons, I would say. You know, like for we've we've uh, talked about it before, but you know, like when it comes to the S5, as a lot of people have commented, there's a lot that the S5 offers that's currently not in the S1, or you know, is really found more only in the S1H and you know, obviously some of that comes down to technology advances and things that are just evolved over time. I mean, if we look at what's happening in some of the other tech spaces like NVIDIA with the RTX cards, the next generation is miles ahead of where the last generation was and they've been able to cost down the method there. Um, just because it has those doesn't mean that it's going to be the camera that a lot of that uh, for certain applications is going to be the appropriate camera you want to choose. Um, already, a lot of us know that the S5, while it has all of the high-end video features, it is a micro HDMI cable, it is USB-C, it's a smaller format, it has the fully articulating screen, which are all things that may not fit into certain styles of workflow. That's where the S1 ends up being, in some cases, the much better camera to use there, like with the EVF being one of those. Um, so there's the, there's a lot that we've kind of talked about with this, about how everything that we've talked and spoken about with high resolution mode and the different photo modes and vlog and all the, the capabilities and frame rates without going into crazy detail with each of the frame rates available in every single camera, because I mean, let's face it, each camera has what? 
seven pages worth in in like the S1 and the S or in the S1H. It has like seven pages worth of different recording modes. There's there's something but, in the know, system for each person. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 absolutely. You're absolutely right. I think that the thing is we're too much comparing them. If you're a business, for example, if I look a little bit back and I'm just talking about one year back, um, I was do still doing television campaign uh, in high quality uh, on the GH5 and it was brilliant and it still is. And of course, uh, with the current system, it gives ex much more. But I think if you're looking and you're, you're looking at your business, uh, I always ask myself two questions before everything. You know, I, my most important part to, to choose what camera I'm going to use for the job is the purpose of the job. So if my purpose is I want to advance my company or my productions into a cinematic rayon, then the, you know, the S1H will help me with that extra mile or that extra uh, uh, part. Um, when you're in, in doing still very hybrid shooting and you do, for example, a lot of weddings, you do the photography, you do all this kind of stuff, then I'm sure the S5, S18, uh, sorry, S1 and the S5 will, too be, will be two cameras that will perform really well. If you're a studio you're doing, man, and I will show you now many portraits or this whole photography thing is there's still a lot of photographers that say really wonderful that video, but I want to do everything on photography. I want to have the best photographic lenses instead of the best cinema lenses. Well, for them, the S1R is the best choice. But if they have tomorrow a job where they tell them, hey, look, I want you to film this. You are a fashion photographer. Can you do something exciting with this new line of fashion with me? And he has the S1R, he can do a video which goes viral on YouTube with the S1R. So he's not limited in any way, but he doesn't have that open gate cinematic extra element that a filmmaker is really wanting. He has that photo yeah. photography element extra in the camera. And I think this is, uh, so there's specialty cameras for the people who want the, uh, just the extra 10%. Or, and the same is with the video. Yeah. And I think this is where the S1R, for example, really excels. Um, if you're looking really into, I want the very highest quality of camera. I want the highest resolution. For me, it's really important. And I will just show you some of the works now. Um, yeah. Just to, to continue to the next, uh, if there is a <laughs> slideshow. Let me see if it works. Yeah. I think it does now. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Hey, there so, it is. Um, uh, this is, for example, a shoot I was doing in Spain. Um, and this is a story about old customs they were having in, uh, well, it was just before the corona uh, crisis broke out, I could still work. Uh, and this is still not a finished documentary. It was the, the project was called the Living Villages Project. And it's about the effect of, of small villages. But here I'm in the Basque area of Spain. And um, yeah, just you see the amount of, of uh, detail you keep. This is S1R. Um, this is this is the customs I was following. So they have these old kind of celebrations high in the mountains, and here's the morning sun is on the uh, on the back on the on the clouds. Well, in in I had to get the highlights back in post because there's so much light on these white clouds, <laughs> and I wanted to keep the shadow details. But you just see how much is in there, uh, just the amount of details and the amount of sharpness. This is S1R at its best for me. Uh, it just captures the oh, yeah. high contrast scenes. It keeps the colors. It keeps all the details. I can have full control as a photographer over what I want to show. Just how much do I want these clouds that have are at the top of the image? How much do I want them to be lit up? The amount of details. If you go, I can't show you here at 100%, but they're really <laughs> outstanding. And why is this for me resolution wise so important? Because this is a project that has been part also of exhibitions. A lot of the stuff I've been making also in the past goes to exhibition kind of spaces in photo festivals and things like that. So then the resolution really makes a difference, uh, difference, especially if you print one meter, one and a half meter, the print, then you get that extra, that extra 10% that you want when you visit the exhibition. It should give my viewers something extra over uh, uh, on the exhibition than what they get when they're looking at, at a screen or an iPad. So this yeah. is for me where the S1R really excels. You know, if you print this large, if you see the amount of details here, uh, it's simply amazing. And of course, these are really photographically interesting uh, customs they have. Uh, here I do this, the portrait shooting. 
I'm using here the uh, SL lenses from uh, from Leica, which is really great that we have this collaboration. You're not only using uh, Lumix lenses, but if you want for a certain look, a certain lens, you can just get it or from Sigma. Uh, so as a photographer, I think you have this extra benefit that you have three companies in a way supporting you and your creative ideas uh, at the same time. So um, at the end, in, in, in three years time, will we have three times more advantage and more uh, speed in development than you will get if you, one company is doing it all, eh, if you compare. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this is again, you know, here it's, it's, I'm doing a lot. I usually use in out of focus, mainly the single point in the middle, because that's how I like and how I learned to work. But as soon as I, I come into a portrait, I immediately switch it to face recognition because I know it works well. And it helps me to focus on the composition. And this is for me, I've said it with the S1, but here also it just, it just, uh, yeah, it's really strong to do. Uh, yeah. Here it's dynamic. They were dancing down. They were running over the mountains. So you, I wanted to get close and, and at the same time uh, get this detail in. So then I put it on a continuous uh, focus and it just keeps, I can just keep photographing while they are really close to me and uh, get the sharpness in the left corner where I want it. So this is again, you're, you're struggling at that moment thinking what you want and then you just quickly change the settings to your needs and you just then have suddenly this calmness that you can just know, okay, just now focus on where you want it because if this goes in a page, it's really powerful to have it at the left and at the right, you can put some text and there's an opening, for example. So yeah. here, suddenly you have this extra benefit of, uh, of shooting. Uh, what you <laughs> see here is again, you know, the amount of dynamic range, the amount of detail, uh, uh, for me, really uh, a powerful uh, way. Photographing, you have this legend of, 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 of these horses and getting the eye of the horse really sharp. You know, I use this scope uh, out of focus where you can go between the, the branches and really get the, the yeah, the, this, this strange white horse, uh, <laughs> interestingly. <laughs> For me, this is where the S1R really excels. It's really about uh, photo photography resolution. It gives you video performance just as good. If you want to use it, definitely use it. Uh, uh, but especially in the color, in the sharpness, in the small details, this is where it really excels. And don't forget, resolution is really nothing if you don't have the lenses for it. So this exactly. one was shot with the S-Pro lens. You know, these lenses are optimized for this high resolution. And you can really, really see it. If if you start putting just any lens on it, you know, with, with cinematic things, sometimes we want the softness of old lenses because it's moving and we don't have that still image. But if you print this two meters by one meter, then you want to go close and see every little hair with which which is there with color. And I think this is where, especially the new Linux lenses, they're really, really designed and from the bottom up with the S1R. So you get this really match immediately. It's you don't have yeah. to use old lenses with old technology uh, on a new sensor. And and yeah. uh, I think this is this is important because we see a lot of other manufacturers also that bring out cameras that are really, you know, they give the highest sensor uh, resolutions or whatever, but are the lenses really capable? And I think this is really something uh, important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, this is the same <laughs> S1R. Yeah, it, it was it was thunder of, of my coming over my house and I was actually just uh, uh, curious. So I went out with the S1R and not really smart because it was a little bit too close, but you know, <laughs> if you go into detail here, there's so much detail, you know, and it's it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 a boring picture. But for me, if, if you see it at 100%, it's actually quite fascinating how many small hairs of lightning there are through the sky. Uh, yeah. This is just, uh, yeah, you know, definitely. the resolution thing. But you can also get creative. And I think this is something, this is me at the right side. Uh, during Corona, we were not allowed to leave the house. So everywhere in the world, people were thinking all kinds of projects, how to uh, get school <laughs> children creative. And my son, uh, they, he was asked to try to represent one of the old paintings at the right side, the famous Van Gogh self-portrait, and try to re redo that uh, at home in a certain way. It was, I think uh, it's called uh, Art in Quarantine or something like that. So of course I felt I had to help him a little bit. And um, this is where we, we sat down. I, I took the hat. We tried to make it exactly the same. And um, uh, at the end, this is S1R. And this is, I think, I'm showing it not because it's, 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 it was a fun project to do, 
but um, a lot of the S1R work and people who use it are in studios. They create footage where the raw file is their just their basic negative for a commercial campaign. So the amount of dynamic range in the raw file and in the file itself is much more important than at that moment the capture itself. So a lot of also, you know, studio uh, clipping kind of high resolution product photography, a lot is about how much of the color accuracy, how much of the detail and sharpness and things are in the file. And if that file is really good in post-production, it's really easy to make things interesting. And this, this uh, picture at the right, he photographed me in front of a curtain and then we <laughs> took the old brush strokes from the real painting and actually implemented those real brush strokes. So you get this really, wow, it's, it's the Van Gogh. It really looks the same for those who know the painting, but at the same time, it's really me. If you know me, <laughs> that's yeah. really funny. <laughs> so my other son, I have two sons. He got the same assignment, but he was not allowed to send me, of course. So we recreated him in this sense as one of the Rembrandts, uh, which is here also in Amsterdam, a very famous <laughs> painting. And uh, it's just fun stuff, but it just shows how much these files are capable of. But even in the direct yes. stuff, you know, this is S1R again. In one uh, shoot we did during a workshop portrait shot. And I'm just showing a little bit, again, the eye, eye out of focus, the amount of details there in the, of course, you see it's 720p, which is not really interesting, but these are, you even <laughs> see the makeup. So this is something with the S1R where you get to the level that you have to talk to the makeup artist and really say, well, look, this is how it shows on the screen. Can you do a little bit less powder or a little bit more of this? Because I'm actually seeing anything and everything you're doing. So it, it's, it's a new level of quality. And I think those photographers who are looking for that, they definitely know this is the right camera for their job. But also yeah. me, I like for photography wise to use the S1R as well. Uh, especially for large prints, it was one of the exhibition series we did uh, just uh, not as long ago. And you see um, uh, there are big prints and then the S1R really uh, pops in. Yeah. So if there's any question on S1R, let me know. And otherwise I'll talk <laughs> about S1A because that camera has really a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so we're we're actually already coming up onto the the hour that we have for the, the session normally. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> there's... There's so much about this, and 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 I think, as as we we kind of have like, you know, really dove into with this is that there are so many different practical senses that come into play when you want to find a camera that works best for your style. For those that are out there, um, like we said, the the whole first half we're talking about the S1 because it is still even to this day such a powerhouse of a camera even though technology has moved ahead a little bit in some other areas or, you know, higher frame rates or higher resolutions are coming out in some other cameras. But there, there are certain cases where the rock solid stability of the S1 has proven itself since day one when it came out. Um, let me see where some of the questions are here, because I know that there's there's a lot of people that have been asking questions. Uh, AG asks, are there any new lenses coming soon? Um, with the announcement of the S5, we did announce the new um, series of lenses that are coming uh, in the very near future. An 85.18, a uh, 24, 35, and 50 1.8, and a 70 to 300 that are coming in the near future. Uh, the 85 is going to be much sooner than that. Uh, so there are additional lenses that will be available very soon. Um, that also answers Cliff's question. Um, let's see here. Uh, I am going to read this one because there, there's, I think, some some confusion or some concern about the way the S5 has come out. Um, this one comes from Glenn. It says he's on his third S1. Uh, it'd be a huge disappointment if the S5 remains a much more capable camera at a much cheaper price. Maybe, um, uh, Diamond, you can also comment on this, but it, there's, I think, certain things that we've touched on throughout this this um, stream here that kind of are, are trying to help put a lot of the system into perspective, right? The S1, it is a full professional build camera. 
full size HDMI. It's got the bigger, brighter, higher resolution viewfinder. It has the triaxial touchscreen on the back, which let's be honest for everybody, touchscreens, no matter what, how a company ever makes a touchscreen, it's always gonna be kind of divisive in the market. Some people love fully articulating. Some people like just tilting. Some people really like the screen that's on the S1H, but it is a larger design screen. So just because the S5 being in the more, you know, obviously the newest camera, which means that it's had the longest time for us to learn as the cameras have come up, just because it has a couple extra features doesn't necessarily mean that it's more or less capable than an S1, or it doesn't mean that the S1 is any more or less capable as a camera in their own. What you need to look at is in your application, does having a smaller camera benefit you? Does having the micro HDMI versus a full size HDMI, is that a hindrance or is that something that's not a concern for you? Um, is when it comes to photography, is having a slightly faster burst rate, having higher, um, higher throughput media as far as SD cards and CF Express cards, what are the important things for you in your camera decision? If those line up into what the S5 is releasing for you, then there you go. You've got an amazingly compact small camera that's feature set to be very close to a kind of mini-ish S1H. The S1 from day one has always been the hybrid camera, which means that, as you were talking about before, Diamond, it's designed to do incredibly well at pretty much anything you throw at it. But if you want to go in and go for that an extra 10% as you put it, you know, that cinema level quality, you need 6K open gate, you need, um, you know, all the full range of anamorphic recording with all the full suite of tools that are available and that screen and, and the builds, build size and robust nature and fully unlimited recording in any mode you throw at it, that's where the S1H comes in. So there's, there's a lot of more than just the face value of when a camera comes out that differentiates it from another or maybe makes it step on another camera's toes a bit. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that, Diamond? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's his third S1 you said. So that he, yeah. he, I don't have to explain to him what a nice camera it is. Otherwise, I'm sure he <laughs> wouldn't buy three of them. But I understand his um, his his thoughts about, uh, especially uh, the new updates on the autofocus algorithm and things. So when I first heard it, I was like, oh, also, uh, th th that's, that's also interesting for S1H and S1 users uh, that want to have that as soon as possible. Uh, I'm quite sure I'm not an engineer, so I can't comment on the technical side, but I'm quite <laughs> sure they have to um, uh, change that for the specific camera in itself. Um, so I'm sure it will come and it will make your S1 just as capable. If there's certain functions that are unmissable on the S1 and you feel it's in the, G, uh, in the S5, then of course that makes an interesting candidate and it's not as expensive as an S1, um, which is a nice extra camera. And I like, for example, the small form factor, but I like the S1 as a camera more because it's more robust. It gives me uh, a better viewfinder and things like that. So I think as a user, you should much more look at it as there's more choice for your needs. And uh, maybe you trade in one S1 and get an S5 next to it. Or you say, you know what, I'm really moving into video. I'm really going to, to collect some money and get one of these S1H cameras. Because for me, that camera is also much more future-proof. So there's the stuff I'm making now and I, I have nobody, I just finished an HDR project and, and it was a lot of work because the whole HDR um, workflow <laughs> is, is so intense uh, to, uh, to, to just uh, slightly say it, especially in the after area where you have to grade it on an uh, HDR TV, you have to have special cards. So you got into a whole new level and then you get clients sometimes that don't even really know how to use the HDR. So, but my content because it's shot in progress role is future proof so now i'm delivering their 4k standard quality uh, uh, sdr version but if they want the same content in a few years in 6k it's there especially my long-term projects which is one uh, cinema film we're doing this is a, a thing that 
I'm not sure, I mean, now with Corona, if I can even finish it, but the idea is, even if it's finished in one year, it's still 6K, it's still much more enough for what's out there. So I think this is much more for me, the S1H, and it's really a powerful camera to uh, to have a look at, especially if you if you come with your experience from an S1, because it could also that you have feel an S5 and you think, well, you know, I have an S1, and for me, there's some functionality I want, but in in general, I like the S1 already a lot. Uh, yeah. A smaller camera doesn't make it a better camera. I mean, I, I used when I just started my career also uh, a Sony uh, in the beginning. And for me, I, I traded immediately in because I didn't like it. It was way too small for my kind of work and it didn't it was not my type of camera. Not saying that it's a bad camera. I just it was not my uh, it was not the kind of camera I like to work with. Um, so you, this is, I think, where uh, with the S1, S1R, and S1H, you, you have a lot of choice. Especially yeah. um, if you're if you're looking at the video part, I would definitely have a close look at the S1H because that camera for me is a really uh, fun. It, I mean, it pushes you also to 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 extend your own boundaries a little bit uh, to what you're doing yeah. with the camera. You know, this is really uh, and of course I'm, I don't know maybe. You're already extremely uh, uh, versatile, so I'm not seeing everybody work, but I think it's uh, it's a really interesting camera for for filmmakers. Yeah. So well, yeah. So we're you... we're we're getting uh, uh, obviously we're we're running a little long on this stream. So let's let's see. Um, you know, obviously we Rounded we up. have the um, S1H to talk about a little bit more. Let's um let's run for about another, you know, maybe like 10 15 minutes about. Um we'll get to about quarter after the hour and uh at at that point we'll um we'll call this session, but obviously this is a topic I think we would want to uh come back to again as far as, you know, all the questions that you guys have. Obviously, this is a bit of a different take on a uh tech talk because it's more of a practical tech talk conversation. But um, yeah, let's let's um, let's let's cover some of that stuff on the. Uh, oh, let me go to my right nice. screen here. Yeah, if I can actually yeah, go well, to my right switcher. There you go. I, I can uh, I can show you one of the pictures. I don't know if you see my screen uh, where you yep. see the S one H, for example, with a PL adapter and the whole thing with an Atlas uh, anamorphic lens. So here you you get the full package in a way, uh, really big with a mat box from Focus. Uh, this is when I work uh, much more on a tripod and uh, I have, it doesn't matter what the weight of the camera is, um, uh, you can put anything on it and just build it out the way you like, full of focus rigs and everything. Um, here you see me moving around with the camera, so you see it's still a, 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 a pretty big camera, but also on a gimbal it works uh, pretty uh, pretty good. Um, so it's it's still the same form factor and you're shooting uh, 6K, uh, I mean this is a uh, really wonderful uh, <laughs> one of to work with. Um, at the right side, you see a more handheld shot uh, kind of kit I created with the S1H with an anamorphic lens, but then from 18, I have a cage where you can just put the screen on the top and you have really like a run and gun kind of anamorphic thing, which is kind of yeah. crazy if you think about it. Um, and, um, and on the left side, this is during a film I was doing in ProRes Raw. And I did some things on the tripod, but a lot I wanted to do handheld. And I like to use old cinematic lenses for uh, certain uh, shoots. So uh, what I chose here to do, because I was shooting also in ProRes Raw, is that I actually made myself kind of created a uh, device on my on my uh, stomach or on my uh, on my waist, where I have the Atomos screen uh, in front of me with uh, with um, yeah with a neck strap looking and following everything I do while I'm controlling the camera with a long HDMI cables and two locking uh, devices. <laughs> but you can get this very quick dynamic kind of shooting and still you're shooting ProRes RAW uh, in, in, uh, in the highest quality, you know. And I think this is, it just shows how easy it is when you have a camera where you can just connect anything uh, to it. And here I'm sort of working again with a soundman, but now we're using timecode. With the S1H, I think that is really, for me, uh, it's, it's the reason I, uh, I really like working on the S1H. I plug in time code, I put it on my sound, man. We don't, we, we connect in the beginning of the morning and everything is in sync, you know, during the shoot. So the only thing I have is an extra 
audio, which is nice to have for whatever reason when, when there's something wrong or my sound man, I don't know, forgot to press record or something like that, <laughs> then you have at least an audio uh, thing. But uh, in general, uh, the audio time code is, is working really well. And, uh, and still a really small form factor, so not as big. Uh, and here, this is one of the setups. I'm doing some of the grading uh, and also checking how it looks on the, on the monitor with an ISO uh, for HDR, of course the ISO 390X, which is also showcasing the, the PQ version. Um, a little bit to, to find, and at the end, the real grading I do on an OLED Panasonic uh, television because that really shows me the peak brightness I need. Oh, yeah. Um, this film is online. You can have a look at it. It's shot in ProRes RAW, but just to show how much you can actually do in post with the colors of these flowers. And this is a, a short film. It calls The Florist. But it's really about actually showcasing... Uh, the amount of grading possibilities in progress role opens a whole new level we can talk probably an hour about just the s1h and the progress role that's coming and probably you've already covered a lot but also from the practical <laughs> point of view it's really amazing for filmmakers because you can get really cinematic in this uh, sense uh, this is the project i was working on here you see again uh, s1h but then from a perspective that i'm doing this cinematic uh, film we're working on uh, during the corona, we had to stop. Uh, my subject is 97 years old, so it's not somebody you can get close to during these times. Uh, yeah. And also, she's in the UK, I'm in Amsterdam, so I'm not even know if we can ever finish the film, but it, it's just beautiful. And you see here, this is also handheld shots, and I try to put my audio down. Um, and, and this is a, a film about, well, her, her, her past and, and it's connected, it's going to be online uh, at probably at the end of the year or something. But here, I wanted to shoot the whole film in this uh, more cinema scope dimension. And the nice with an S1H is you can just uh, view and see what you're actually doing because you have your grids, you have your look already in it. So I'm recording as I want to actually have the, the look. And you see also this is all uh, a much more flat kind of image because it's an old cinema lens I like to use to get this really softness in, in this highlights, but still a crispy uh, uh, look in the, um, in the person. You have all these choices. And I think this is really uh, where for me, this, this camera in a way uh, excels. And if I uh, yeah. go back to my uh, main screen, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, I stopped the presentation. So, you know, in the one day, on the one side, you can have a camera, which is just like this really small camera you can shoot your 6k footage and do your whole event or like what i just showed you have your whole rig and you have your whole camera and you have everything on it <laughs> and it, it works the same and i think uh for filmmakers this is really a big thing because if i have a job and i know i'm i'm easy i put everything on there i just take that camera if i know i want to be close and intimate and that's a signature of my my type of work also is that Sometimes you want to be uh, small and, uh, and and not so present. Then I take the, uh, the the smaller form factor. And of course now, I think, because this is something we've talked about S1, and I think especially the, the S5, just, just as a comparison when you have an, an S1R, I mean, just the size can be a really thing for people to say, you know, oh, I yeah. really love this camera. You know, I think this is for me the camera I do most of the photography with because it's so outstanding and it just gives you that extra that as a photographer, I want to deliver. I'm not sure if my clients know or see the difference. I think <laughs> sometimes, well, they don't see the technical things, but they see there's this extra in it. And this is something you'd want to do with photography. But if I go into the town or if I have something, this is a camera I take easily with me anywhere. And it's, it's, it's small, it's form factor. It's just like the S1 probably an underestimated camera in, in, in the long term because people, uh, a lot of the stuff we create, we don't need the best of the best quality. I mean, we've mm -hmm. talked about S1H and we talk about ProRes RAW, which is really amazing. But even without ProRes RAW, that camera is approved, you know, for the post production alliance of Netflix to be used. I mean, what more do you want as a filmmaker? You know, if you have a camera, <laughs> no, but seriously, that's, 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 I think uh, it's, it's, it's at a lonely height there amongst the big cameras of a lot of money. Um, and, and you can just pick up that camera and make something which is 
good enough for them to broadcast worldwide. And I think what, in a way, the GH5 did for a lot of users, opening up video to the world through video and through YouTube and all kinds of possibilities, the S system opens up the this, this same possibilities, but to the higher end markets. And I think yeah. as a photographer or filmmaker, this is why, what I want. I want my equipment to help me lift my game up to the highest level so I can be part of, of, of that, that area without having to think, oh, now I need to be a broadcast camp company. I need to invest hundreds of thousands of euros and have a big office. Otherwise, I can't deliver that same kind of uh, quality. And I think it's amazing that we get this creative freedom uh, and, and uh, to work with. And whether you like a small yeah. camera or a big camera, that doesn't matter. At the end, it's all about what we shoot with it and what we yeah. uh, create. And I think this is something... We, we should definitely talk about technologies, but we should also much more talk about, look, guys, what we are creating and what we're doing with this. Because I think people will see how much you can actually uh, get out of these cameras uh, just just by going out and, and finding great stories. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's, that's a good segue to, to close out this week's Lumix Live. Um, obviously, everyone is very very um invested in wanting to continue this conversation so we'll uh we'll definitely you know kind of like what i was mentioning at the beginning of this uh, uh session we want to try to start setting up kind of a a monthly straight up ask me anything style uh stream where you guys can know that on say the last thursday of every month unless something comes up uh, you know, we would we'll, we'll have a session where the comments and everything that are submitted throughout the videos when they're up on YouTube will pull from those for the content that you guys have questions about and you guys want to actually really see an entire session on. So what I basically would like to ask everybody to do is if you have a very specific topic that you're interested in, that you want to hear us talk about, Go into this video when it's uploaded onto face or on, onto Facebook when it's uploaded onto YouTube after this stream is over, and put in the comments there what you want to see in the next you know kind of Lumix Live AMA session. We're always trying to build these these events to become more and more interactive with all of you. We have more and more support team that are actually in the comments, checking, finding out an information for a, a, a question that you guys ask if it's not something that I can answer on camera, because let's face it, I don't know everything. I have a, I have an entire support team that helps me when there's, you know, those curveballs thrown that I'm just not really that aware of. So, um, yeah, so. Once this video is up on YouTube, make sure to go into it, drop a comment in the comment section for what topics you want to see us talk about in an AMA. I will be having those go in for this week through next week's session uh, at the end of next or at the next Lumix live session on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I will pull the comment section and start putting together the following week's Lumix live. So we'll really try to have this as as driven by the community as we possibly can. And obviously we won't get to every single topic, but we'll pick out the most commented, most requested points on that, uh, on the uh, chat for this particular video. So a little bit of a call to action for all of you guys out there watching. With that being said, uh, Diamond, I want to thank you for spending the time and joining me on this Lumix Live. I think it was an incredibly informative session, but from a very practical sense, you know, actually going out and using these different cameras and showing how they excel in different areas. Um, for those that want to follow you and keep up to date with you outside of Lumix Live, outside of the Lumix channels, where can everybody find you online? Well, uh, my website, uh, diamond.nl, uh, I'm building an, an, an international still one, but uh, especially I think Instagram, Diamond X, just my front name with an X behind. Um, Facebook, I have to say I'm not that much on Facebook, more on Instagram the last, uh, the last uh, months. Um, but I mean, uh, Google me, you'll find me. It's, it's not, uh, and you know, I, I, I'm open to people uh, asking me questions. Uh, I've tried to reply. Uh, as much as I can. I mean, I can't say anything if people start asking stuff that it's about Panasonic. Again, I'm not the person to say that. 
but definitely other stuff. So if you are having technical stuff or stuff you think, hey, I want to show something, uh, I like it. I mean, I'm now not traveling, so it's good to have some digital friends and, um, you know, get conversations. I mean, I think it's always interesting to hear other people's thoughts and other other things and uh, definitely uh, give a shout out. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, as always, I want to say thank you to everybody who has joined us on this Lumix Live. Uh, all of you in the comment section below, uh, you guys are what drive this forward. We know that we can't get to every single question. We always try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, and I know that you guys have a lot of... Uh, obviously a lot of questions still uh, about these topics. So just like I said before, make sure to, once this video is posted onto YouTube, so the chat here, once it goes, that's a live roll chat. Once the video is actually up on YouTube and it's a, a standalone video, put your comments in there uh, and I'll start pulling from those so that we can uh, uh, you know, come up with a more dedicated live AMA style based on your guys' requests. With that, again, thank you everybody for tuning in. If you haven't already, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you get notifications when we go live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll see you all next week for the next edition of Lumix Live. Thanks for watching, everybody.